It's time for Talk Word, Cringeworthy Tales. And now, your host, weekly humorist, editor-in-chief, Marty Dundix. Hi, and welcome to Talk Word. I'm Marty Dundix, editor-in-chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine. And this is Talk Word, a fun little podcast where professionally funny people come to tell awkward and cringeworthy stories. Uh, I'm very excited about today's guest. He is a repeat uh, Talk Word guest. He was one of uh, one of our possibly first, he wasn't our first, he wasn't our second, he might have been our third. I got to go back in the archives. We got to see what number uh, uh, he was on on Talkward. But he is back and better than ever with a book to boot. We're going to talk all about it. I'm very excited to have Tom McCaffrey here today. Welcome, Tom, and thank you for uh, coming on Talkward. And congratulations on this brand new awesome book. It's called Born Funny, and thank you. it's a, uh, a comedic's chronicle through the rise of alt comedy. So welcome back to Talkward, Tom McCaffrey, everybody. And uh, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Oh, that feels so good. It feels yeah. so real. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being on a small, terrible stage in a basement in the Lower East Side. Right, and then you I'll hear, take it. And you hear some of that, and then yeah. you get brought back to the world of stand-up. Oh, yeah, that, the feels more, that feels better, more like it. The memories. The one. Um, um, this is so exciting. Thank you for coming back on. It's been a couple of years. Um, and thank you for sending me this book. I uh, I tore through it. I got I got to almost the end. Oh, okay, cool. Well, that's, that's good. But, but that's only because I started it yesterday. Because I am a bad person with deadlines, and I was like, oh, I got to read this book. And I I read in one in one sitting, Tom. Really? I read, I read almost this entire book. And this book is not a tiny book. This book is almost four hundred page. This book is four hundred pages. Yeah, it's um, I'm kind of amazed by that sometimes because um, I have a hard time uh, re- I have a hard time reading books, so writing one is just I don't know how I did that, but I'm also surprised at people that have read it because people will contact me and say they they read it, and I'm like, really, you read this whole book? Amazing. Well, I just I just feel like no one really you know reads, right? I mean, isn't that kind of like where our society is? The I appreciate about- you reading it. The tough thing about reading books is it does require attention that people do not seem to give anymore, you know, 100% attention, you know, more attention than than it takes to drive a car, it takes to read a book, you know? That's true. You know, when you're driving, you're kind of like, mm, mm, you're everywhere. You're, you're doing all kinds of stuff when you're driving. But oh, you, yeah. You can't do that when you're reading. I've forgotten. I've been driving sometimes and then just forgotten that I was driving. I'm like, oh, yeah, wait, I think I'm driving now. So that there, there is a, there's a hit. There's a, a word for that where you forget the last like half hour. And it's like highway hypnosis or something like that, where you're just on autopilot. Yeah, that sounds safe. You really can't <laughs> be on autopilot when you're reading a book, though, because you you are in to this story. And um, the story of this book, this character uh, Steve Collin is surprise everybody. It's Tom McCaffrey in disguise. I don't want to mm. ruin it. Uh, well, but the yeah, whole time yeah, I'm reading true. this book, I'm just picturing you in every single thing that happens to Steve. <laughs> I'm just seeing Tom, and and he just keeps on. He kind of gets beat down uh, over and over again. This this book is about your career in stand up comedy, told through a heightened uh, novelization uh, of storytelling. Which I think is a really good way to do it because you know some of these memoirs are clunky and they're kind of weird or they're unbelievable. But the way that you were able to weave a story around your true life, you know, a little bit of things here and there to add little pizzazz uh, yeah. to make it entertaining. Uh, but I mean, it's it's a, it's an easy read and <laughs> Thank it's you. fun. It's definitely a fun book to get into, especially you know I'm I'm uh, 44. <laughs> Uh, I've been in New York City for 20 years working in comedy. So I used to. Could you relate to some of this stuff? I mean, I think I was waiting to, for, to, to, to see a, a fictionalized version of a, of a jerky me just kind of sitting in the corner, you know, being a, 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 a jerk or something, because I could picture that the night at Rafifi that I can remember many times being there. Well, what uh, page I, are you on? Am I? I was actually kind of worried about that. I was you're like, in the am, last. You're in I, the last thirty pages. The, the last part that I didn't read is like, Marty. I thought we were going to talk about how much I uh, shit on you in this book, but you didn't yeah, even get yeah. to that. P- um, I, I I introduced a guy named Schmarty. So it's um, <laughs> it's not you. Um, and it is it is me, but it is a you know slightly you know fictionalized 
Um, I, I guess I got the idea from like Charles Bukowski, where he would write um, under the surname Henry Chinoski was the name <laughs> of the. So, um, but it was clearly him. But you could kind of tell he was taking some liberties because there is stuff that didn't happen. You know, I, 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 um, I trumped up some stuff kind of to be for, uh, comedic for like you know humorous effect, almost like I was uh, the Forrest Gump of comedy, kind of affecting. Huge you did moments of comedy. It was moments. it was very fun to find those little moments that you did weave through. There are bold faced names in the book that are character that are themselves the people that you interacted with on your way up in in the career path, uh, who were just starting out, and it's fun to see how they were, um, you know, sprinkled in, and it and kind how of how I gave, shaped their careers. How how they owe you everything. <laughs> but you get no thank you, Tom. No one's patting you on the back. I know. Um, I'm used to a, it. I can tell. I know you're used to it. It's so funny because, you know, you you the way that the, the character describes himself being detached and nonchalant, you are so detached and nonchalant of a person, yet you look at the bio and you look at the credits and all of the things you've accomplished, and it's... It's remarkable, Tom. Well, you're kind of my... Are, are you considered Gen X? I'm a cusper. So I think I'm a, I'm kind of an in-between. I am I was born in 1978. I think I'm, I think I'm just... I'm still analog. So I kind of put all of us analog people together because we had that shared experience of growing up and sort of being like latchkey kids where we could just leave um, for yeah. a while. And then we would come back when the streetlights came on is when we had to go home. And it wasn't a big question on where we were or who we were with as long as we were we were sort of always in the same zone of friends' basements within the neighborhood, riding bikes. We weren't right. really going anywhere. Yeah, but I, I mentioned in the book that um, I am a Gen Xer and that was that, you know, bef before Gen X was even a thing, like a term that existed, um, the, the Gen X attitude, kind of the way I grew up or, you know, my generation grew up was we were very detached and aloof, which was kind of our defense mechanism. It was kind of... Oh, yeah. Very Bill Murray. I could definitely relate to everything that you were talking about with, with comedy comedy heroes and this the, the attitude of... I don't, I don't care. I don't care. I don't... Because it's can. like, you're not... You, you do care, but it's also kind of like the Gen X was also kind of... Because I'm the youngest in my family, and there is a little bit of like... Gen X always was the um, discarded younger sibling who wasn't really getting the attention. And the defense to that was, well, I don't really care. I don't really need attention. So it was kind of like, it wasn't cool to um, really, you know, talk up yourself or, or really, you know, we would brag and stuff, but it, it was just kind of like the attitude of, you know, it was like uh, Nirvana. Yeah, we know, you know, like Nirvana was like, yeah, we're really famous and successful, but who cares? We don't really, we don't, you know, we're not about money, you know, a big thing in our generation too, I think, was like selling out was a was a huge deal. You know, you remember that? Like I like I remember when like Reality Bites came out, and that yeah. was like a big. That was like the Gen X movie. It was very like selling out was like was this the cardinal sin of our generation. Yeah, you couldn't be obsessed with, commer you know, materialism and commercialism and caring about what people thought of you. So, but you did, you know, we did. Yeah, people had to make money. It's always so funny because it was like, "What are you selling out?" You, and it's like, "Yeah, because I don't, I can't, I can't afford food." Uh, and then a as you get older and you realize bills and, and you realize all these all this crap that does pile up, you're like, "God, I need to start an Etsy shop or something." I don't know what people expect of me, but um, you know, you got to do something. Yeah, and I think now I don't even know what selling out looks like now. I don't even right. now. It's kind of the opposite. It's almost like. Um, it's almost a badge of honor and almost like shows it, it's almost illustrative of you being successful when you right. will have sponsors on your show. You know what I mean? It's almost like, you know, if you don't have a sponsor or don't have a commercial, it's kind of like you're not legitimate. So I don't even know, which I think is a good thing. I don't, I don't, but it's also weird. I don't know if you've experienced where, with the whole social media age now and stuff and like promoting yourself. I, I had a hard time adjusting to that because deep down, you know, in my marrow, I, I just was not, that's not how my brain operated. It just and a wasn't... quick break to uh, for a word from our sponsor, coffee. <laughs> coffee. It's the only reason I get up in the morning. Back to the show with Tom. I'm glad someone's getting the word out about coffee finally. <laughs> <laughs>
So you started, I mean, and it's fun to read. To read this book is fun on two levels. It's an entertaining story, but also I know you, but now I know you a lot more because I've, I've read intimate parts of your life now. You know, I mean, this is a very intimate a portrait of a, of, a, of a man who is you, a fictionalized version of you, but you can tell that the, the majority of the storyline is your life. So, I mean, you've had such an interesting life, Tom. I mean, growing up in New York oh. City, amazing right the east village area yeah so uh kind of around gramercy park yeah amazing and then you go to the fame high school right and you're like an actor guy you're going through all this actor guy stuff and then you have drama <laughs> because you're an actor guy drama stuff happens to you and then you go to los angeles eventually yes yeah but you don't go to los angeles right away and uh, what happens from actor school not getting the showcase Wow. I feel like I I feel like I just lived your entire life in this book, which is crazy to to get to talk to you about it now because it's like. And how does that feel being an author? This is your first book. How does it feel putting intimate details of your life out there on the printed page for people to buy and read and consume privately, and they're reading you? How does it's that... weird. It's definitely you know I I think when I was writing it and you know going through the publishing process, I um I had moments of oh you know I guess this is going to be out there and people are going to read it. But I, I think it, it, it took so long kind of, you know, from the, um, you know, from the, when it, when it went the beginning of the publishing process to when it actually was published that I started to forget what I had even put in there. So <laughs> I do have moments every now and then where I'm just like having a realization, like someone will be like, Oh, I read the book. And I'm like, Oh fuck. Like what <laughs> did I say? Cause that's kind of why I wanted to make it, me but not me it's why i changed my that you know the name is different and um i did change some things here and there but uh because that made it again it was kind of a little bit made it a little separate from it and detached from it so i think it's again part partly it's like the gen x in me where it's like well it's not really cool to just like write a book laying everything out there that's me specifically it's kind of like i can still hide under the guise of like well it's not really me right I mean, it is because someone did point out to me mike kaplan i was talking to because he read it and he was like oh uh, you know it's so, you know that your name it's not you but you know i noticed that you know the character puts out an album with the exact same name as your album and i was like <laughs> oh yeah that's true <laughs> like that's a pretty <laughs> specific um detail that i didn't change so i, I don't know it, it, it's because weird you want, it's you very want people weird. to go you want people to go and get the album you can't go p put a fake name of a fake album it's like well i'm not really doing myself any help uh promoting a right. fake album in this book i know i probably should change it something like you know the album was called wilson phillips in the um in the book but um lou diamond phillips was uh I just got, I think I just put it in there and just forgot, but it's weird. I, yeah, yeah. I just forget what's in there and it's, it, it is, it is weird. But I, like I said, I think I just assumed no one would really read it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you know how it is even just, and not a book, but something you put out there. You're like, well, no one's really going to see this or listen. You're like, Marty's only going to read the, the summary on the back before he asks me about this book. He's not going to read the whole book. Look at this guy. He's obviously a slacker and you're right. <laughs> but for this one, I read it. <laughs> It it is weird, and the people who are reading it is surprising me. It's um, Co is just, it mostly comedy people? Is it like a lot of comedy people? I'm sure would be just engrossed, comedy people. A lot of people that I didn't. Book. Well, yeah, well, people that I knew kind of at that time, like you know, the, obviously, I guess they would have they'd be more invested in it because they were they were also there. And it's yeah, I feel like it's one of those things. It's been long enough since that happened that you right. can look back on it with a certain nostalgia where you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was like kind of a uh, that was a fun, interesting time. But then I also talk about the struggles of it and how hard it was like when you're really. And I think that was a big part of, you know, what I wanted to get in there was like the comedy you know at first when you you start doing it it seems like oh i'm following my dream and this is fun it's like we're all like funny people and it's comedy but comedy really is a grind and can, and it can really take a toll on you and it's tough and so much drama it. comedy is so much drama it's such a emotional and like you said in the book comedians they just constantly are just yearning for this approval on a nightly basis every set you know, it has to be the best set you ever. 
you know, it, it it's like you have to do it over and over again to keep doing it. That's you, what's that's what's really hard. Just, and it, it seems it never a, ends. A bit insane because as a non comic who was going to these shows, I was a national I was I came to New York in two thousand and two and I had a job I was work I was a art major in college. I was an illustrator, humor illustrator for newspapers. I was working for the New York Press and my day job was working at Letterman. And I met really? everybody. Yeah. So I met oh, all the cool. people at Letterman. I worked in the audience department. So I was working with all the people that were, we're checking in the audience. We're chatting with people. We're giving out tickets. It's like, oh, it's a, you know, it's like were a you a page time. ever? I worked next to the pages. So I was a recruiter. So I worked next to the pages. Yeah. I made like a two bucks more an hour, not to brag or anything, Tom, <laughs> but um, I didn't get to wear the cool little jacket, but uh, I had a little lanyard and a clipboard and, um, but I work with like Kevin McCaffrey and Jamie and all those folks. And that's how I met Kevin uh, and a lot of comedy people. Ben Schwartz was there as a page when I was there. So he was just starting to do the UCB stuff. Wow. And so it was kind of like. Whatever happened at, to him? You know, I haven't heard. I don't think. I think he burned out pretty fast. I think he <laughs> yeah, burned out yeah. pretty fast. So it's fun kind of being in the world because people come and go and you see people rise and fall. And it's it's incredible. Right. And you were this like this active participant in this in, in this movement as it was happening, which was a a tangible thing. This comedy of the aughts, where right, right. there's all these you know there's the main clubs, you know there's you know there's Dangerfields and then there's Carolines and then there's Gotham and and comedy then you have and... yeah Boston Comedy Club right Boston Comedy right, Club yeah I remember that and, um com yeah comic strip was over at the. Uh, no, not the comic. What am I thinking of that closed? It was in Meatpack. Comics? Comics with an X, yes. Yeah, and that was an interesting one because that was sort of opened in the late aughts and their template, uh, the, their um, vision of it was to be sort of like a corporatized alt scene club. So it was kind of going to be like a Caroline, like a big kind of club. It was too. It meant it was gorgeous. And it, it was nice. Burned. It just closed down so fast. Well, it was around for a little bit, you know, and I did perform there a decent amount towards the, I actually, you know, it's interesting. I think I'm the, I'm, th I'm the last person to have ever performed on that stage. <laughs> that was a great um, area. I remember going to a big show there. I think with Kevin, I think uh, Kevin McCaffrey was on that show. I went to that show. Then we all went to um, Coyote Ugly, uh, or the bar next to Coyote Ugly. That was the real Coyote Ugly. Oh, um, Hogs and Heifers. Hogs and Heifers. We ended up at Hogs and Heifers. And that was a wild time. That was after this. There was a big show. It was like a big, huge thing at comics that night. And everybody went to Hogs and Heifers, and that was a crazy, crazy. And then I woke up on the, on the, on the N, coming back from Queens <laughs> at like... 8 a.m. It was all commuters, yeah. and I woke up and I was like wearing my like a nice outfit from last night. And I was like, mm, 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 off to work. You're wearing a Letterman page outfit. Everything's you're fine. Like, yeah. You're like, holy shit. <laughs> Gotta go in. No, it's I'm I feel like the aughts were just kind of store that just a bunch of stories like that, right? And then I just woke up on the street, you know, and you're yeah. like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everything was fine. I just went home and there was no there was no long term damage, so everybody was fine. Right. Um, so uh, you started doing comedy uh, pretty, uh, pretty. I mean, you started quick when, when you were in the station wagon as a child. You told your jokes. And then after high school, <laughs> you did stand up comedy in New York for the first time. I did. Yeah. So what, what I uh, I think it's in the book. The first time I ever did stand up was I was when I was in college in Dallas, Texas. I was taking, That's right. you know, studying acting and they were like the teacher had this assignment where he said we all had to do a stand up act and it was a bunch of you know actor people and they weren't funny really so and i had actually you know been funny as a kid and i had entertained the idea of being a comedian even though i'd never really i wasn't that into stand up but i did it i think it was like 19 and i, I like killed you know i was great and for, you know my class they weren't funny and and i i did i was funny like i had some but my jokes were pretty damn good and um <laughs> and i did it there um, in debt, my teacher was like, you're really good. You should do that. And then, um, he, I went to like a couple of open mics in Dallas and I did them and I, I hated them. So I was just, you know, I was just terrified and I didn't like it. And, um, and then I came back to New York and I was like trying to 
uh, I guess I wanted to be an actor. I, you know, I, I'd kind of gotten that, you know, thought in my mind in high school, that's that, that school kind of drilled that into me. And I was, you know, it's a very impressionable age. And, and the problem was then I started people I went to high school with started becoming successful in the entertainment industry. So I was like, well, you know, if they did it, like, of course I, uh, you know, I had, I'm like, well, that's how the entertainment industry works. If your friends make it, like you should make it too. And, yeah. Uh, it's like a contagious, it... it's contagious success. Right. And, and I'm like, and they, I'm sure they can't wait to help me make it too. Um, mm -hmm. But then it wasn't really going well. And then I took a, someone was like, you should take a comedy class at comic strip. Cause I wanted to do stand up, but I just, you know, this was back in the, you know, late nineties. It was just like, if you wanted to do something like that, you just, it was really you had to really do research and legwork to find how to do it there was no the internet was like barely a thing and you know you weren't so i had to like look in the paper and find a class and then i started it that way and um and who was in do you remember the stand-up comedy class or who taught it or who was in the class with you it was um it was me and dane cook and uh no i'm just kidding no, it was uh <laughs> the guy who it was at it was at the comic strip and it was um df sweedler who's i think he's still a comedian he you know I, I feel like i definitely have seen him in the last like about five years ago um and i wasn't going to be like you know oh i i, I want someone to teach me how to do comedy it was more at the end of it you had to you know do a showcase mm -hmm. show so that was going to force me to do it and um I'm, I'm i remember there was maybe like seven of us in the class and it was a lot of like one guy who was maybe 40 and was like, yeah, I remember he was like, yeah, I failed at everything in my life. Now I'm going to do this. Um, and, but that made jokes... an impact that made an impact on you. You, you came out of there with five minutes of, of material. Yeah. I had some material. I, I, you know, and I did the showcase and it was, it, and I remember it went pretty well. Like it was like a bringer. And I, I remember I did well, like for, but again, I don't know if you remember your first time doing stand up or your first early times. It's just, just it's such a weird i i can remember specific because you, you remember the comic strip had this it was different than other clubs they, they had like a door that you had to come out of yeah. to go on stage so it made it even like scarier because it wasn't just going on stage it was literally like you're waiting to go out onto like it's like you're making a huge entrance into a theater so i remember being backstage and just being like what am i doing why am i doing this um which I feel like I always have. Yeah. <laughs> Never goes away. It doesn't, right? I mean, do, do you have... I really have stage fright. I mean, it's the not, only it's time not crippling. Want, the first time I did... I remember th growing up, I was a huge fan of stand-up comedy. And my dad was a fan of stand-up comedy. So he would have records, right? So he had all the old records in his record collection. He had, like, Steve Martin. And he had, like, the old Bob Newhart stuff. And I would play it. And I thought it was hilarious. And I remember um, at some point, I can't remember how old I was. I was like, it's been like 11 or something like that. And there was something delivered to the house that we, that they had delivered to our house that was for our neighbor, but they weren't home. So they were like, can, can they drop it off? And it was like this antique broadcast microphone because the guy wor worked in radio. He worked in AM radio, This the guy at the neighborhood. And I remember this microphone was gorgeous, chrome, shiny microphone. And they had they hadn't picked it up for a couple of days. And I was just pretending to be a stand up comic as a child talking into this microphone, was holding it. Yeah, you know, really? I was just pretending to be like I was on stage. I just thought it was amazing. It was so and I had it like low enough for me. But it was like this old like, you know, the old shore, like almost like an Elvis microphone. Wow. Like what I have back there. I just remember play, playing with and pretending like everything I was everything was so hilarious. Everything I was saying in my head. Was did so you have hilarious. did you have worked out jokes yet? No, or I was to... I would I was just pretending to have punchlines. Like I was. So you were. were I you was into... mimicking television comics because I would Fox uh, would show Sunday nights. They would show was it Comic Strip Live? Yeah, I remember syndicated that show. show. It was it was on uh, against you know um, SNL. Yeah, and I remember they would it was do a, it was a quandary because it was like. I want to watch this, but now SNL's starting. I, you know, now I got to go back and forth. So it's like, you know, 90s stand up comedy, early 90s stand up comedy, and 80s stand up comedy, huge. And then they all got sitcoms. It was all very influenced television that we were, co you know, constantly watching all this stuff. Or do you remember the episode? I don't know if you ever watched Silver Spoons, but there was an episode of Silver Spoons, and Ricky Schroeder is going to a comedy club, and he's being kind of a jerk, and he starts heckling the comic. 
and making some jokes. And the guy's like, oh, you think you're so funny? You should try getting up here. And then he ends up taking a stand-up comedy class. And he does stand-up comedy. And then someone heckles him. And then the whole thing comes full circle. And, is wonder- and as a kid, I watched this. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Well, that's funny. I did watch Silver comedy. Spoons, and I'm very well versed in pop culture, and I don't remember that episode. Was that kind of later on? I do not the, remember the show. He was older. Uh, he was older. He was definitely in his older. It was the older years. I feel like in a lot of '80s sitcoms and '90s sitcoms, there were there were a lot of episodes where stand up comedy came into play, where like they would meet a comedian. I remember a Facts of Life had an episode. And do you know Jeffrey Joseph, that comedian? I don't think so. He's a comedian who I, I met about 10 years ago. And so anyway, he, there was a Facts of Life episode where some guy just comes into the store that they own and he's like funny. <laughs> and Tootie is like, you should be a comedian. And and he's like, yeah. And then she sets up a showcase for like uh, the Johnny Carson booker and he does stand up. <laughs> and then so anyway... About nine years ago, ten Tootie. years ago, I was at a sh- I was at a show, and Jeffrey Joseph went on this comedian. I hadn't. I think he he had stopped comedy and was coming back. And I was like, and I went up to him. I go, "Were you on Facts of Life?" <laughs> <laughs> and he like started laughing. And he was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Oh my god, I totally remember you from Facts of the Facts of Life episode. Where, you know, where you were the stand up comic or the funny guy." So, um. That's yeah. They always they always had that. They would have just someone like Twenty One Jump Street had an episode where yeah. one of them wanted to be a stand up, and um, it was like a very glamorized uh, profession, you know. Yeah, it was thought of as especially like around that era. It definitely yeah. was. Um, but it's funny. I wasn't that in. Like it wasn't. I I was I was really into comedy young. Like I was into movies, comedy movies, and but I wasn't like the 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 art form of stand up. What didn't like I did. I feel like. You know, you're you're younger than me, but like when I was young, like there was like two stand up specials my entire you. It was like Eddie yeah. Murphy and then right. Richard Pryor, and then that was it. Um yeah. so I feel like I wasn't and then when that comic strip show came on, that was kind of an interesting thing because it you was were great. exposed. You were exposed to a lot of new comedians, but that and it was, was like, edited. It was so edited down, it was amazing. It was like the best five minutes of every comic across the nation at so many different clubs. Yeah. It was almost like, you know, America's Funniest Videos, but it was VH, it was videotapes of just people in clubs. And they're like at lowest production quality value ever, but they were just running it on Fox once a week as like a syndicated show. And, I, you know, I'm just like mesmerized by it. And it's, you know, all the jokes are clean. So nothing's like edgy, but it's funny. It was, yeah. I mean, it was a, it definitely, I think it brought a lot of people into the medium who were like, oh, I could do that. I, well, I definitely. That. Yeah, definitely. And I was a kid. I was pretty young. And I remember watching it and being like, oh, yeah, this is this is something I feel like I should be like I was I was into it. But it was also, again, going back to my Gen X roots, like it, it was never cool. And I think it was also another it was like I was a New York City kid. So like Gen X and a New York City kid those two things it was like it wasn't cool to admit to liking things yeah so i was always written and people would make fun of it as i got older like they'd mention some great movie and i'd always be like it was all right you know and they were like what, what do you mean it was all right what you what, don't you like anything so um i was i, I and I, I do like things a lot but yeah it always feels like <laughs> like there's just something deep in me where like i just can't admit liking things i feel yeah. like it makes you look weak or something but i'm getting better at it I'm glad you're getting better at liking things, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're a huge Bill Murray fan. Who else uh, were big stand-up comedy influences for you? Um, it, S- Steve Martin's books, Born Standing Up, is fantastic, uh, reading about how he started doing stand-up and stuff. It's so interesting to hear how people get into stand-up, especially ones where, like, Steve Martin started his career mostly because he wanted to meet a girl, and he started doing stand-up. He didn't really have any material. He just went up there and just made a couple of dumb jokes and played like a banjo. But he just wanted to get on stage so bad. So when you started, you had a lot of, you know, observational type stuff. Like you were kind of doing a lot of observational kind of stuff with jokes, fresh stuff, like immediately. Um, I'm, you know, it, whenever I, it's funny, whenever I hear about someone who's really successful, you know, in entertainment or, you know, not just comedy, 
what's interesting is I feel like there's a running theme where they're usually like, I never, ever wanted to do this. I never cared. And then all of a sudden, I, I everyone was like, you're the greatest. And then I became really successful. Um, so comedy, I feel like I, I, I was funny. And stand-up comedy, it seemed to me like nothing else was working out. And um, that's kind of how I ended up doing stand-up comedy. Cause that is like, what I've heard. I've heard you have to be bad at everything else. You can't do. You can't be good at anything else and be a, a successful stand-up. You have to pretty much only be good at this one thing. Well, it's. I think it's like to end up doing that. Something has like gone wrong. I, and I don't. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like a tragic. You have the worst background or life, and it's not for everyone. Because I mean, there's definitely comedians that like. They didn't have like, you know, they were really into it. like Seinfeld seems like someone that just loved comedy from the beginning and was right. just knew what he was going to do and knew how to do it and was comfortable from the beginning. I like was funny and people always told, told me it was funny. I think I was just the idea of going on stage and just standing there and having people, you know, I was always funny around people and it was the stakes were really low. But, you know, it's, it's yeah. really different once you get up there and you don't know the people and, you know, they have the ability to they have the choice of not liking you is always yeah. like it's rough, especially if you are funny in life and you're used to everyone thinking you're funny to go up there. And then people are like, I don't like it. It's very like it's hard. You're like, but everyone likes it. And that's the hardest thing about comedy is just like figuring out what how you're funny on stage and it what sucks about it is like you have to figure it out in front of people for like years so yeah. that's a hard thing that's why i feel like things have to just not be going well for you to be like well i guess i'm just going to keep doing that um <laughs> and it is like i mean it, i'm it just really... gonna i'm just gonna keep falling down the <laughs> stairs every night <laughs> but you're just like and also, usually it's better if you're young and you just kind of are idealistic and you still think things can work out. And um, so hope. it's like you yeah. still have hope. Yeah, you still have hope. And um, but it's also like, you know, it, it is like that old thing that people say about it, the cliche. And like it is addicting. You do get addicted, especially if it goes well a little bit, because then yeah. you're just like, oh, OK, I want and. That's the thing, too, about getting like stopping doing it is so hard. But I don't know. People are always like, you know, because I stopped doing it as much. And then people are like, well, how can you not do that? I mean, you love it. And it's like, but what if I like smoked crack? Like I loved crack. You know, it's like you love crack. Why don't you do that anymore? It's like, well, it's not really working for me anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't smoke crack, but I'm saying like it's kind of that analogy. Um, it's an addiction that it it's not as bad as crack or something, but it can be a negative experience for you if, it, if yeah. it's going in a wrong direction. You know and what I mean? And it seems like there's people who it is addictive in a, in a I need approval so much that I need to keep on going up and I need to keep on telling these jokes to strangers and I need the strangers to like me. And if they don't like me, it's going to ruin me. And then I have to do it again tomorrow because I need to get these new strangers to like me. Right. And I and think what what is repeat, healthy, Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's a really good comment because it's like, I think where I did get, and I think where a lot of good comedians get is they finally get to a place where they're not doing it for the approval. They're doing it for themselves. And they're kind of, they, they're not worrying as much about what that, you know, what, the, what the audience wants them to do. So in your, in your book, your character and yourself, you, you kind of figure it out. Uh, when you stopped caring is when you started doing the best. Right. Which is such a, you know, you, I, that's when I'm at my best. And that's when I think most people are at their best. The problem is, I think I might mention it there is that it's so hard to, to do that consistently, like um, kind of on demand. Cause I mean, when you're going, you know, there's so many things that pe you know people don't understand that go into doing stand up. It's just, it's like, it's like trying to be relaxed in the most unrelaxing scenario. <laughs> it's like trying to be relaxed and natural and light on your feet during a prison riot. You know, yeah. it's just kind of, you know, it's like kind of like when a car crashed or it's like, if you're in a car crash, like just relax. That's the safest way to be. If you're just, re and it's like, I'm in a car crash. Like, how am I going to fucking relax? That's why it seems like when there's a, when there's an accident with like a drunk driver, the drunk driver is usually the <laughs> least injured because they are <laughs> relaxed. Exactly. And then they don't sustain massive injuries because they don't go like this. They're not scared. They're just like, wee. Right, like and in then the, 
in the movie Due Date with Zach Galifianakis where he falls asleep while driving and drives off the bridge and Robert Downey Jr. gets hurt and Robert and Zach Galifianakis is just I did not see Due asleep. Date, but now I, I need to see it. And Zach Galifianakis he gets mentioned in this book all the time. There's a bunch of yeah. people getting mentioned in this book. I really found it fun to, you know, it, it was a great way to figure out what year it was, when it was, when you were kind of placing the storyline, who's new to the scene. Oh, look, it's Sarah Silverman. Oh, look, it's this new guy, um, Aziz. It's this new guy, you know, uh, oh, this, you know, this new show. They don't know what to call it. They're, you know, let's call it Chappelle show. Like all these little right. things are are, are are kind of sprinkled in throughout. Um, oh, here's Amy Schumer. Yeah, we met you. I met you at that show Trainwreck. Oh, what a good show name that would be. Right. And it's so, I give, yeah. I give Dave Chappelle the idea to go to Africa to unwind. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun it's all these little hidden easter eggs uh for comedy fans in the book and uh, there's a couple of people that like you disguise them other people you don't disguise they're famous and then other people you do disguise so now i have to go and google a bunch of people in the book because i need to figure out who they are because there was uh, some alt king who's in a cult military school comedy mm, yeah nice and i now i need to look that up any because clue I have no, yeah. Can I get a clue? No, no, I can't. Damn it. I'll, tell, I'll tell you later. I, I, I feel like that would be kind of the fun of of it that so some now, people would read and be like, "Are Who you is that? are you worried about people reading this book and being like, Tom, I'm not happy about this book." Yes, I I, I was <laughs> worried about that. Um, more as it got closer to the the release of it but like i said i think i just assume i i feel like i've put so many things out there and whenever i put things out there i just assume no one is even aware of it so um <laughs> you're like you're like i've had this entire <laughs> career in comedy i feel like no one has seen it so why well, would they read the book even if people are seeing have seen things and i feel like you know because i've done things people will contact me but I, I still like just don't believe anyone is 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 aware of it so I thought of that. And then I was like, well, if the worst problem I run into is that so many people are reading it, that they're mad, a couple of people are mad because it's become so popular. It's like, I guess I can deal with the only thing is I will say like the people whose names I really use, I don't say anything bad about them. So, and I'm not, it's good. All the interactions I had were like did happen. Like I'm not like pretending I interacted right. with you know John Mulaney or something. But like these are the people that were around when I was coming up. But yeah, I don't say the only ones I and I even the people I disguise. I don't like I don't I don't say like the worst. I just say they were kind of like jerks to me. So yeah, that, there's nothing um, in there's nothing in this book that is a bombshell terrible. You know, like this person murdered yeah. a hobo and then. Cut them up and get, you know, no, there's nothing like that. Well, you haven't read the last part about you. That's a good yet, point. So. That's a good yeah. point. I, that, that could be, homo. could be all about me murdering a hobo <laughs> in the last 30 pages. Damn it. <laughs> that, that darn smarty man. He's getting smarty. himself. Into some, he's getting himself into some shit. He's um, murdering all those hobos. <laughs> um, no, so I, you know, I, I think, you know, the only thing I was worried about is like there might be some people that were like, "Look, I didn't give you permission to like say that you knew me or something." <laughs> but... <laughs> I don't but... think that uh, you can uh, get in trouble for that anymore. I don't think so. And I, you like know? I said, I don't say anything bad. I just say like, um, and then I knew them, and then um, I think there's one thing I don't say like Mike Berbigley. I, you know, I, I kind of talk about when I met him and it's not really bad it's just kind of when i met him he was like he tried to power he kind of power he, tripped a little bit he was just a little bit like kind of you know i could tell kind of like sniffing me out like who are you like who is this guy because he was when i kind of met him when i first moved back to new york like he was a real up-and-coming guy and he was very established in the scene and everyone liked it and i think when i you know, I, I think when I just met him, he was a little bit like standoffish, which is just kind of how comedians are. You you know how it is like when you go when you're new to a scene, you're going around. It's like it's weird. Like people are kind of like they don't know it. I think there's a comment. I don't think I, that it's so it's it's bad for someone to not uh want to want to talk to you, Tom. Maybe he didn't want to talk to you and he I was standoffish. And I think you're allowed to write. Uh, this guy didn't like me because, uh, you know, I'm Tom. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, full of bravado and I'm intimidating. Yeah, exactly. And also, I think I make the comment that comedians, it's like it's like the mafia. They, they don't trust you until they see you kill. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Like, you don't get cred until you perform and it's amazing. And then they're like, oh, my God, that guy's really good. And then it's like 
But it's interesting how many times you get slighted in the course of the career where you do well, you meet a new person, and then that new person does really well, and then you see them a couple months later and they act like they don't they don't even know you anymore because now they don't need you. Right. That which is, is a, a big which is a big deal. I mean, that happens in every kind of en- entertainment industry, but definitely actors and and comedians where people use other people to get ahead in nice ways and in not nice ways. And if 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 someone is only a user, they're not really a friend, but they act like a friend. But then they, once they don't need you anymore, you're kind of dead to them. And that yeah. kind of seems to happen a lot in this book on both coasts in L.A. and New York. Little things like that do kind of happen. Yeah. Um, and um, I think it's. Yeah, the, I, I do talk about it. And that that, w- that was something that kind of, you know, took me by surprise, which it, looking in retrospect, it really shouldn't. I mean, like, it's sort of like a lot of the people going into that industry, it's it's very competitive and, you know, they want to get to a certain place and they're going to kind of do whatever they they can. You know, it's 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 a fine line because it's like if you're ambitious, you, you're you going to be opportunistic and try and do whatever you can to get somewhere. And it's sort of like, I think I used to take it a lot more personally, like back in that time period. But looking back, like, I don't really take it personally because it's just that's sort of how people are. And that's the nature of the business. They weren't, they, it wasn't like they were slighting me specifically. It's just, right. that's, that's what they were. So, and it makes sense because it, it's a lot of talented ambitious people and that's how i mean no one likes to talk about that in the world but it's like people who are successful and really ambitious they get to where they are by a lot of times not being the nicest people so now what happened this book is full of juicy stuff tom now what (laughs) happened to the female producer who tried to seduce (laughs) <laughs> uh, the main character in this book, and then when she was rebuffed, suddenly the main character didn't get picked for the for the for the festival. I think um, I ended up marrying her. So. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fun That's fact: so fun. I'm getting my own sitcom now. So no, um, yeah, nothing. I feel like I haven't really. You didn't keep in touch with any. I definitely. I, I didn't. I didn't keep in touch because she kind of stopped being in touch with me. But uh, gotcha. that was kind of an interesting. Yeah anecdote yeah. where um i did and i do remember when that was going on i have you thought to tell- yourself i should have just gone for it i should have just well i i don't, I don't remember the, how should, i i should have played the game well i mean that's kind of all I, I think about that a lot now i'm like <laughs> i should have played the game a lot more than i was playing the game um well that was more of the i don't know how i i, I kind of remember how i characterized it but that was more like it was like it's kind of like a blurred it wasn't so cut and dry what was happening but i do remember it was you know she was very friendly to me and seemed like she wanted to hang out in a friendly way and then when i was around her alone it the the vibe and the tone kind of shifted and felt different and i didn't really i wasn't good at navigating what was happening so it wasn't like she was like hey sleep with me and i'll give you this but she was sort of acting like that would have been a lot more cut and dry i think i would have i would have been fine with that transactional situation right which maybe would have been you know i might have you know gone for it but um it, it like like i said i think what happened was she, after that kind of odd experience um she just stopped returning my messages and this was someone who was like kind of had approached me under the guise of like hey you know i think you're really great and you're really talented let's hang out oh, i'm really you know do it. and um i was like oh so how come we're not friends anymore so mm. uh i don't know i don't i think that that person just ended up being like a an, you know a high up exec and they kind of were at they're the just running the studios now it's fine probably i mean you know but there my, was my, that stuff. story isn't as, as interesting as like the you know brendan fraser story which was the brendan fraser story where did i miss that no no not in that i mean like just oh in oh life. oh in, the re- in, in reality the brendan yeah, yes yes, where yes. He, like i'm like was where was the, where was the brendan fraser in this book yes the last 30 pages <laughs> The last 30 um, pages with Smarty killing bums. There's also a big Brendan <laughs> Fraser section. Yeah. So the guys, so you went to high school with Adrian Brody. Is that correct? Yes. Do I say his name specifically in the in the in it? Do you say it later when he's up there kissing uh what's her name when he wins the Oscar? Halle Berry, yeah. Halle Berry. And he is kissing her uh forcibly, right? He's he's performing, he's doing this thing, and she's kind of like, okay. And then uh, you say I'm looking at him, knowing that, um, like I, that that was the kid that we uh, we fucked with in Central Park, 
um, made fun of in fourth grade or something like right, that. Right, right, yeah. Um, he and I, there, I'm sure you remember there's a part where he in high school he's um playing the piano and I go, do you do you know how to play the piano? And he goes, I'm pretty good, but I'm not going to win any awards for being a pianist or anything. Pretty good. <laughs> Now who now he wasn't the guy that's the Hollywood that that's the the high school friend who you see in LA in the beginning of the book. No, he's that's There's a else. different person. Yeah, that's an I went to school I went to the fame school so I went to school with like a bunch of people who like kind of so you many know, people. became famous and stuff. So So amazing. Um, and then the whole thing starts out as a child you went to the Oscars when you were like 10 or 11 or something. Yeah. Because you were part of a documentary film that 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 was up for that for something. I was someone I, I took this um, when I was in sixth grade, this famous choreographer would go around to to elementary schools and, and you know, teach dance to kids. So, like it was like an extracurricular extracurricular thing that everyone had to take part in. And if you thought you were, you know, especially talented at dance, he would pick you to be in this thing called the SWAT team. And there was like 50 to 60 of us from all these different schools. And um, we would go on Saturdays and take like advanced training or whatever and it was supposed to be like this big honor and uh one week he said someone uh, made a documentary about him teaching kids dance and it got nominated for an oscar and he was like well you know because it got nominated that some of the kids in the SWAT team were in the uh, the documentary and um they were like well they thought it'd be cool if like we were we were on the show and so we we danced to uh the song what a feeling with irene cara um and also, this is I don't so also I think I mentioned it, and I didn't realize this until about five years later. So like, the documentary won the, its category for best documentary, and they were like, if it wins, you guys all go on stage with him, and you know, and accept the Oscar. So I just looked at the clip recently, and you, I'm to the left, but you can see me at one point. I'm just standing up there with these kids during. So I was also up there during an Oscar acceptance speech. And I looked it up later. I didn't realize the guy who won it later on directed Dirty Dancing. So I was up a few years before the guy who directed Dirty Dancing. I was up at the podium with him accepting his Oscar. Uh, and the funny part is when that happened, I had no clue what was going on. No, This is how clueless I was. Like They were like, hey, they brought us to the side of the auditorium and they were like, Hey, if, you know, when we say so, just run out there. And so I just ran out there. I didn't know we were up there accepting an award with the guy you yeah. know so <laughs> it's amazing and then also during the interaction that you write about um you talk to jack nicholson you talk to um shirley temple yeah shirley Te yeah <clears throat> and what does jack nicholson say to you well the what i i he basically says you guys were fantastic because we danced on the show and like it was, you know, like in the Oscars, a lot of times they'll have so, sort of like a novelty thing, you know, someone who's just kind of on the show, you know, kind of on a peripheral thing. Like, so we were considered that for that show where we were these kids who yeah. were on the show and doing this like dance routine and like um, they were really into us. I think people thought it was cool. And then when the thing won and we were out there again, it was like another moment for us. And Jack Nicholson, I remember, was just literally right in the front row and he won the oscar that night, night for terms of endearment so i remember when i was standing there for the acceptance he was like literally like 20 feet away from me and he had like sunglasses on and i remember like i knew who he was but i didn't really know that much about who he was i knew i was like oh it's a guy from the shining and so when we were sitting on stage at the end he like walked he was walking they used to do a thing on the oscars they don't do it where like at the end they would have all the winners yeah and people mingling on stage at the end and he was walking on stage to go to mingle and he walked up to like me and my friend we were there and he was like you guys were great and he like was holding his oscar in his hand and um and then i i kind of expand a little bit in the book which is kind of where the I take some liberties where basically i suggest that he should be the joker in batman um so superhero Which, movies they never catch on exactly i also make the comment that the hollywood should make more superhero movies to jack nicholson and and he's like no they're not going to do that and i'm like they're never well. going to do that
But it's, I mean, it's so many people in this book that are, are real people that you met and have seen along the way of their careers. And then, but the Rafifi was so much fun because when you were describing the Rafifi, I was thinking to myself and I was reading and I was thinking to myself when I'd been to Rafifi and I was, uh, one specific time I went, I was on a date with a girl I had met on the match.com. This is the very beginning of the internet dating. And she was writing an article about dating. So she matched with me and she was like, um, just to let you know, I'm writing an article about dating. So, so. I'm going to write about the date, if that's okay with you. And I was like, sure, it's fine. So I went out with this uh, this girl. I take her to Rafifi for the date. Really? Because I, I like going to Rafifi. I like stand-up comedy. This is like 2005, five, six, something okay. like that. Right in the... So it was like right in the sweet spot, because I go right. there, and it's Bobby Tisdale hosting. It's Eugene Merman. It's Leo Allen. It's Berbiglia. It's like a party. Yeah. And they're, you know, Tisdale comes out with a big thing of like jello shots. And it's just like, everyone gets jello shots. And I was like, okay. Like, it was like nuts. It was fun. It was, it was insanely fun. So much talent was on stage. And yeah. Remember, those lineups are, were crazy. They're crazy. And I remember walking out and Berbiglia was sitting at this bar by himself and he just looked sad. And I was like, hold on. I want to tell him that he did really well <laughs> because he just I want to cheer like, this guy up. He didn't look happy. So I was like, hey, I just wanted to say like how great you are. Da, 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 da. He's like, oh, man, thank you so much. It's so nice of you. And then um, I thought that was so funny. And then she wrote about it like in her little magazine. And it was like she called me funny fella. And we went to this place called Rafifi. And, da, 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 and she just described the date. Oh, wow. Like, Is that like online somewhere? I've looked for it and I couldn't find it. But I, I can't remember what the name of the thing was or wherever it went or anything. But I definitely yeah, it was it was a wild thing to have. And then to read your account, of it's just like, wow, I was in there not realizing uh, what like a microcosm of like this entire scene was was happening right here in this place. And I just would wander in like I didn't know. Any, I mean, well, I that's what's Ash weird. Yeah, that's kind of when I started writing it. I was like, you know, as I got into it, I was like, it's really amazing thinking of like how this thing started so small and then like what was transpiring and you know and just kind of down in the east village and people just outside of it had no idea and like the lineups that were there that if they were happening now would just be like these insane lineups and people would just walk by this place not knowing like these like john mulaney and nick yeah. kroll are doing a show with like 20 people in the audience yeah um, it was great it was yeah, great. So and it's then, kind of been interesting. And then when Eugene stopped doing, I live in Park Slope, so he he, he was local at the time, and he started doing uh, Beyond the Painted Veil at Union Hall, which became like the next spot for him to do that group. You know, there was the same kind of people. It was right, and uh, and he would host that in the basement of that for a long time, and then that kind of became. And then also like the UCB with like you know uh, Whiplash and and all the stand up that would happen there. I love that. The UCB by the under the Gristides was absolutely just like a just a fun scene that we it wasn't yeah it, you describe it really well in the book how much it was the anti-establishment of comedy and it was just like this place where just hipster you know cheap poor uh, kids in their twenties in New York City who were just comedy nerds would just hang out and watch we would what would become uh, the the kind of talent pool for SNL, everything that was like a Parks and Rex or The Office or any right. of those shows of that type of humor ended up just being people that you saw on UCB teams, right? Yeah. Or people that were hot in commercials. Anybody that was doing anything that involved an actor having to do improv uh, in the ad or the TV show came from like this farm team that was just right. all just percolating there. Yeah, and it was amazing the things that, um, yeah, the, sh the shows that I would end up on down there that were just sort of like, what the hell am I, like, what is, like, I remember I had to want some, I was, I think I was doing, I think it was Whiplash at that point, because it was Crash Test at first, and then um, it was, I think I was going on last, and Janine Garofalo and Jim Gaffigan were on the show, and they literally were going back to back before me which i was like great all right i'm this is this should be easy and not only did i have to follow them but they did this thing where when one of them was out there i think it was like janine garofalo was out there jim gaffing came out and they started kind of like fake wrestling 
on stage and then i was after that and i remember i was just like i remember i references but i'm like how am i supposed to follow this like these are like these two comedy icons that like were heroes of mine before i even did comedy and like I have to follow them doing stand up and doing like some kind of weird wrestling thing. So it's just kind of, and that was just like a Monday night, you know, like, um, so yeah, it was just, it, it was, it was one of those things that wasn't lost on me while, even while it was, I, I feel like I had moments where I was like, this is just crazy. Like what that, that I'm here doing. And now that you've written it all down and, and it's, it's out there in the world. Are you, are you feeling nostalgic to go back and do more stand up? Are you yeah, doing I mean, stand up uh, as much anymore? I'm not doing it as much. I mean, like I in the last couple of years, I like I still do it, but I don't do it. You know, I don't really pursue it. I, I only really do it if someone will just ask me to do it. I don't like put myself like I'm not um, I'm not chasing it. And um, it, it's kind of an interesting thing because I almost feel like you know, doing it less, it's one of those weird things where like, um, it's like a paradox doing it less. I feel like it's almost made it like me a little bit better at it because I'm not clinging to it as much. And like, I'm, it's like, it's one of those things. If you're chasing something like, and clinging to it too hard, you're the grasp of it isn't as strong. Like, so like, because I've really this, let go of any expectation, this, this brings on a good, uh, you like to, to, to bring in the top gun quotes. Uh, in the book a little bit, uh, Cougar uh, was holding on too tight. And right. Cougar had to let go. Cougar lost it. He turned in his wings. He lost the edge. He lost the edge. And uh, I don't know if people at all understand any quotes from <laughs> Top Gun from the 80s, but at the very beginning of Top Gun, Cougar was the better pilot than Maverick. And he bugs out. And he Cougar crashes. was number one. You guys were number two. Cougar lost it. He turned in his wings. You guys are number one. Um, you guys are you two characters. Yeah, are going to Top Gun. I think it was also like Maverick was maybe <laughs> the better one, but he was the uh, he was the Maverick. He just did, he kind of didn't play by the rules, so they didn't like him. And uh, Cougar, he he did everything right, and he was kind of the the more um, the more. Uh, disciplined pilot and um but it is interesting yeah like but that is a real i didn't even think of that because i do talk about top gun where he says because i compare stand-up to that where like if you think up there you're dead because it's like and with stand-up it's very like if you just get too in your head about you it you do you lose it it's, you get up and there it's really the smallest thing can can throw you off someone in the crowd says something someone sneezes something bothers you and you can tell because when I was producing the stand-up comedy, the uh, the guaranteed delivery shows, which you so graciously did. Yeah, I remember that. It was great. Um, you know, something can turn a crowd so quickly. And you're up there, and it, maybe everyone's killing, and the crowd's great. And then someone goes up there, and something, they say something, they do something, and they lose it. And they lose this momentum, and it's gone. And you can yeah. just tell. Someone goes, I've seen people who are really good, who kill, who are so funny. And they go up there with a great crowd, big crowd, and they'll something bothers them, the show does tank. They tank, and then they sink harder, and then they can't get it back, and then they make it worse, and then they just leave. And then the next guy has to go in, and he has to fix it. <laughs> because, like, good luck! <laughs> I I know. It, it It really is. That That is the amazing thing about Stan. And, like, the more, like, I talk about in the book, like, the more I did it, the more I realized how hard it was. Like, it it's just... There's so many obstacles that can get in your way and and it it really is mainly just a mental game like it's just like if you if you overthink it or yeah it's kind of like with cougar like if you if and that's kind yeah it's kind of what i was saying like if you're hanging on too tight like for the result of it for like what you think it's going to get you then and i also feel like if you keep doing stand-up and you know maybe you get frustrated with, with your act it's like you can get stuck in what your act is. And then when you, yeah. kind of, I've noticed when I kind of walked away a little bit and like, wasn't doing it as much, it's like different now. And I almost feel like oddly not doing it as much made me almost grow as a comedian because I had to, I was approaching it different. I wasn't the same comedian as I had been. So I felt like I had to like, the only way I evolved was by, I don't, you know, it's that thing. I don't know what it's like. I almost feel Buddhist. like when you're not doing it every night, it becomes less disposable. And it's a little bit more precious, and maybe you care about it, 
and, and people go up there da, 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 and they just like sometimes they'll they'll start and then it doesn't go perfectly in the first five seconds and they're like fuck this this crowd sucks fuck them they hate me they're the worst and then that's their attitude right and then some people like it, nothing seems to bother them outwardly the crowd does not affect them and they are almost in, insulated from it and i feel like that's the way you kind of have to be where you don't care you're just up there and everything's fine and then you just kind of and there's you can tell the different types of comics or maybe just where their headspace is when they're up there and certain people could do a, their act and kill to just like a, an empty room or a, a, a two people in the audience and their act is just as good with that two people as it is a packed room and it's just a kind of a discipline where yeah. you know like i got yeah. i think uh, uh, Sean Donnelly is someone who I feel like can do that, or or yeah. like a Mark Norman, where it's just like they they have it down, and it just seems so it seems natural, but they're so disciplined and polished, but in a in a in a not uh, pretentious or like overly so way, like their personality still shines through. Like Sean is just so funny, but he could be funny anywhere, and I feel yeah. like I've kind of seen him places, and you're kind of like he's always good, you know. Well, like nothing, also nothing I, seems I, to set him off. Yeah, I, I definitely also think like the, also when I kind of like step back from it, I, I started actually enjoying watching comedy again and I would go back and watch the comedians I always really liked. And it's funny because it made me I feel like I discovered like three years ago. I was like, wow, Norm Macdonald is really funny, which is like I always knew he was funny, but I was watching him and I was like, oh, my God. And that was from like not being around comedy. So. I, I started watching a lot of specials of people I really like. Like David Spade in the last four years became like one of my favorite comedians. Like he has a special, the um, Take the Hit that I watch all the time. And it's a good example of he's not like killing the entire time, but he's hilarious the entire yeah. time. So there is a weird thing I realized of like everyone gets obsessed with killing and I, you know, I killed and I got this many laughs. And it's like, I started realizing like the people I think are the funniest aren't really that concerned with killing. They're just always exactly, you know, there's a thing like you'll watch a comedian and maybe they're not getting huge laughs the whole time, but they are killing like the crowd yeah. loves them. So I started realizing like, even if I'm not getting the laughs I think I should be getting, I still think they can think I'm really funny. And also, like, as long as I think it, as long as I'm being entertained, that's kind of, I got more into that, like where I would like record myself and I'd be like, wow, that's really funny. Like, I think that's and I, I start being like, I can listen to myself and think it's funny. And I was thinking, like, I almost guarantee you the best comedians in the world, like. Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock or Louis C.K. I, I guarantee they can listen to their acts and be like, this is funny. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, they can. I mean, but also in in, in the what, what you said about how it's not about the jokes killing, though. It's about them just being themselves, like them being this whole character, this whole person on stage. It's not about going up and just having joke, 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 joke. And each thing is an individual thing that people can be amused by. They're being amused by the entire persona that that person is is being on stage and they're being it so confidently right and that that it's like they could they the audience at that point is eating out of their hand and they could say anything and the audience would laugh because they they are rooting for you at that point like if you get the crowd on your side and they like you as a person and and what you're bringing like if if David Spade is being very David Spadey just the, just a look he could just kind of give a look and everyone laughs right so like that's the kind of thing that it, it, when people can master that it's just kind of like wow you know they've really they've really right. cracked it because like they're not even they don't have to tell a, a setup and a punchline anymore they can just kind of say a comment or a thing or make a gesture and everyone's like roaring and you're kind of like that's incredible that's amazing like that's and the even magic. their missteps will right. be funny even when they're not being funny or like they say somebody doesn't do that well it's still funny it's like a weird um but I got more and, you know, it's weird I because I stepped away from it I, and I started watching it again. I felt like I became like a student of comedy because, you know, like you're doing comedy a long time. You kind of feel like, oh, I got to figure it out. I don't, you know, really do any more research. But I, I, I approached it more as like a fan again and was like, oh, like this. And, and the fact that I would just get into Norm Macdonald and David Spade in the last four or five years. I mean, I was out there funny, but I mean, like David Spade now I'm, I will think is like maybe the most underrated stand-up and out there just because he he's really successful but 
I don't think he, people think of him as a great stand-up, but I I just watched his last special and I thought it was like I feel like he's one of the most like his persona is so fleshed out and great that it's he's so just, consistent. You know, he's so yeah. consistent. Yeah, and it's like even if his jo- a joke isn't that great, which they usually are, like it's just he's so funny. You know what I mean? It took me a long time to realize that a lot of comedians, it's not really their material. It's just they have such a unique take on things. Yeah, that's so funny, and so. you believe them. You believe that that's him, you know? Like some yeah. people, they play a character on stage so much that you're kind of like, no, I don't believe that. Like, I don't believe that that happened to you. I don't believe that, that you you said that to that person. And a lot of comedy, you're obviously not actually happening in your real life, but you have to believe that that happened to them in real life. And yeah. if, you, if, you don't, if you don't bring that to the table, if you're not making them think that that did happen to you at the grocery store, or on the subway, <laughs> then it's not going to work, you know, like, right. you know, people, they can't always be talking about, uh, you know, my girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, you don't have a, yeah, there's no exactly. way this guy's, there's no way this guy's getting laid, you know, yeah. like sometimes people go up there and they have a setup. That's not, that's not true. And you can tell right away. Yeah. Maybe they he, do have a girlfriend. I'm just being horrible. And that's true. I can be horrible. <laughs> too. He, um, I uh, yeah, and he, he's uh, going back to the Gen X thing. I feel like David Spade w- w- is a very Gen X ish persona because he came up in the '90s when Gen X was kind of um, first becoming like a term that people were talking. And he, I, he just encapsulated the very like aloof, a detached kind of like snarky, like yeah, mm-hmm. I don't, care, I don't care. What <laughs> everyone's so stupid, you know, like that kind of everything. But so what, the, I think what the Hollywood what minute. Is, the Hollywood Minute. Oh, yeah, exactly. Bay. Like that. Ugh. I mean, it's that right there is like it's almost like that's when he really tapped into his what his voice was. Um, and he but I think what saves him is he could come off as like maybe a total prick, but he's very self-deprecating too. Like he really and he's almost like what the the Pete Davidson before Pete Davidson, because yeah. he was known for just being single and like just all these hot women were like super into him and um yeah, he, he did. He's always does well. You know, he he's always doing well. He's not like the leading man that you think. And then, but he he has the personality. It gives hope to a lot of people. He just, yeah, he really, he just, he's one of those guys. He just is like him. Just talking is funny. He's and and Norm Macdonald was to say Norm Macdonald yeah. like had a oh, thing God. where it was like he just talked in funny. I don't, you know what I mean? Like anything so he said is his, it, like, I don't even, his interviews are more entertaining than his stand up. Um, he's great. Norm was so funny. I mean, his stand up was great. His weekend update was amazing. So influential and so many people on delivery and just like the way that he would turn. He had such a turn in his jokes. Oh yeah. And the turn so was funny. always the, like God. exactly the thing. Like there was no like um, misdirect. It was no. the exact. <laughs> it was the, it was the blunt thing we were all thinking. He just said it and it was so good. And he good would go one. on Conan a lot and like do a bit and it would bomb. And he would just be like, ah, I thought that was going to be funny. <laughs> and it would be funny how it, or he would just be in the middle of the story and would just kind of end the story in the middle of nowhere and just be like, ah. So where do you see this now? So this is going to go, it's going to become a huge bestseller. Um, and then oh. ad- adapted to it's going to be a screen. It's going to be a, a a comedy movie or a TV show. And who's going to get stuck playing you? Are you going to play yourself in this? I'm assuming you know Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, probably. I think I think a Timothy. Yeah, I could see it. I could probably. definitely see it. We, yeah. we went to he went to the Fame High School too. So I, you know, well, there you go. You guys see each other at the alumni events. Yeah, of course. You could yeah. s- slip him a copy of the book, and and he will be. Uh, he I'll will just be look him up on the directory that they they send out to everybody. Um, no, I mean, I you know, actually, when I first had thought of it, I was like, yeah, I feel this could be a, like a, a series of some type because I'm, you know, they made a what was it, it was called? I'm crashing dying up here. Well, crashing too. I'm dying up here is one of my favorite shows, definitely about stand up comedy, but such a good show, right? Such yeah. a such a dramatic but fun show about stand up comedy, and so it's the most authentic stand up comedy show that that there's been. Like it's so dramatic, but it's so accurate and also it was cool because it was for that specific era that was a very impactful (sighs) era that era was great and it was Uh. similar because they had main characters in it who were maybe playing an amalgamation of people who were there but they weren't the main character people weren't the actual people yeah Um, but they were on the periphery were all the people that like richard Pryor and all the celebrities so that's kind of when i was writing it that was kind of part of the pitch when i was trying to get it published was like 
it's kind of like the I'm dying up here, but for the aughts Aughts. alternative comedy scene. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's a thing I I was thinking of. All I need now is to, you know, get uh, some huge Netflix execs to um, get behind it. But uh, it's funny because Pete Holmes kind of his his i mean he he doesn't it's not about the alt scene it's just kind of about when he was doing comedy but he does have like an episode where he goes to rafifi to do yeah. stand up so um they're obviously and you like Mulaney is in the in the episode and bobby tisdale so it's kind of an interesting crossover but i was like oh i'm going to focus just primarily on that and also but, uh, kind of but a, tom you were not in that episode tom I know. Well, I I think I just you know believe me that was not what? lost on me when I saw the episode. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is going on here? You're getting dissed again. Again. <laughs> I think it was between me and Mulaney, and he went uh, with Mulaney. You know, uh, such a popularity. It's like the, the story of my life I between know. me and Mulaney, and Mulaney gets it. So people need to get this book. I'm not going to take up your entire day, but uh, I will tell people they have to go pick up the book. It's born funny. I'm going to read the last 30 pages, and I'm going to be very angry all of a sudden. But I haven't gotten there yet, so I haven't, I haven't seen the part about me. Follow um, Tom on uh, on Twitter at Tom McCaffrey and uh, listen to Tom's uh, podcast Last Exit to Brooklyn. How is that going? And- it's good. I, you were going to be on it at one point, but um, yeah, I like think, six uh, years ago, uh, six I years know. ago, you invited me to be on it, and I was like, yeah, I'll get back to you, and then we never did it. But we, can well, do I think it. you were scheduled, and then you had to cancel. But then this was before the pandemic, where now you can just do it like this. Because it's funny when I was about to do, you know, and I was getting ready to do this, I was like, oh wait, well, how am I going to get there again? Wait, gonna... and then you were like, here's the link, and I was like, oh yeah, that's how it is now. You can just do it. We don't have to leave our homes, isn't that? So you great? can. So I mean, yeah. You. Should, I mean, if you know, if you want to come on, we can do it. It's easier. It'll be harder for you to get out of this time because it will you, be. You do it this way, so I can um, be on it literally any time now. Okay, cool. All right. So yeah, well, I'll hit you up about that. And you've been doing how long has the uh, last exit to Brooklyn podcast been on? Tom? I think it's been like eight years. I had kind of a um a a time. First of all, I went to law school about seven years ago, so. I was doing it during that, but I kind of, I think, took about seven or eight months off because I was so busy. But um, it's things have changed so much because, like, when I first started it, like, no one in New York City and like in comedy had a podcast. It was more like an LA comedy thing, and so it was just it was kind of a um, anomaly, I guess, to have one. But now, just everyone has one, and it's like not even comedy; everyone in the world. So it's just kind of. Um, Another tre- another trend that you started. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. But uh, I think I talk about that because I started around the time Ari Shafir started. I remember when he was first talking about like having a podcast and I was like, what's that? He was like, yeah. And he was like, yeah, Joe Rogan. I'm doing this thing with Joe Rogan. I'm like, what? Um, <laughs> so I don't know whatever happened with that. <laughs> it'll never it'll never take off that Joe Rogan podcast. No one's going to listen to that junk. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah check out my podcast check out the podcast Lex has exit to Brooklyn check out the book Born Funny Tom McCaffrey at Tom McCaffrey on Twitter thanks so much for being on the show Tom this has been wonderful catching up with you yeah you too thanks Thanks. I'll hit you up about doing uh, our podcast you will we will definitely do it okay Okay. thanks for being on thank you for listening and I'll see you next time bye bye thanks for listening to Talk Word Please subscribe, follow us, and visit weeklyhumorous.com.